<laughs> right. Well, again, thank you all for coming. And uh, I'll introduce Brian Sloan, uh, who's going to talk to us all about the excavation, the very interesting excavation at Cathedral Hill in Downpatrick. So thank you, Brian, and take it away. Thank you. I'll just try and get this sort of here. Can everybody see that okay? Yep. Yep, happy. Yeah. Three. Well, thank you. For, uh, everybody can hear us. Sorry, my laptop isn't the best. Can everybody hear me okay, yeah? Yep. Yep. Three. Um, if this kind of breaks up a wee bit, will you tell me and I'll, I'll try and go slower, go closer to the microphone or whatever like that. Uh, thank you, Ryan, and thank you very much. I don't know, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you tonight. Um, what I'm, this is a kind of odd way to do this. I'm not really used to talking. So I'm sitting here in my kitchen just talking to my laptop and I can't see any. See the, just see the, the screen in front of me. Um, what I would usually like is that we would do this in Queens and then we'd all bugger off to the parlor and have a few pints and kind of discuss it and, and you'll have a bit of crack that way. But, you know, the way things are, we can't be doing that. Uh, so I'm going to talk very briefly, probably over the next half hour, 40 minutes or so, if that's OK with you, about, uh, about our recent excavations in Cathedral Hill and Downpatrick. Um, this project was carried out uh, in association with the, the local council, Newry Morning Down District Council, and uh, in association with Down County Museum. And it was all funded through the Peace Four, uh, European Union Peace Four, uh, funding stream and, and thank God we were able to make use of that before that avenue of pleasure was closed to us. Um, what it was, it was uh, what we call a community led excavation. And uh, what I mean by a community led excavation is that uh, it wasn't just us archaeologists at Queens that carried out the dig. We invited uh, members of the local community who are not archaeologists, but they have a they have an interest in their local history and in, in a site in particular. Uh, to come and give us a hand excavating it. And we treat it kind of like the way we would uh, the training excavation module in Queens, where we would um, teach the people how to excavate, how to identify stratigraphy, how to identify archaeological features, um, identify different finds, and, and do a wee bit of recording on all that. And it's a very worthwhile exercise, not, not just for for the volunteers and for the local community, but for us as archaeologists as well. And I'll we'll talk a wee bit about that towards the end of the presentation here. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly really about the preliminary results of this excavation. And it, it's a story, it's a constantly evolving story. Uh, the trenches uh, were backfilled in September 2019, but since then we've been working on what we call the post excavation program that works. And uh, that, that whole process is ongoing. Now it has been hampered by the COVID restrictions, but, uh, but we have got an awful lot of information from the site so far, and that, that's basically what I'm going to talk about tonight. But the site has still an awful lot more information to yield. And then hopefully in, in a year or so, Ryan is doing the animal bones for his dissertation. Aidan's doing the, the pottery, I think, from the excavations as well. So there's going to be other aspects of the story that's going to that's going to come out over the next coming months. And we'll we'll take all those bits of information and mesh it together for the final publication. So hopefully we'll be we'll be looking a wee book or something out of this by the end of it. Um, so we're talking about Down Patrick. Down Patrick is located there. It's located about 45 minutes to the southeast of of Belfast. And it's in an area called Lakeel in County Down. Now Down Patrick's it's famous for being for being the burial place of St. Patrick. And we're in, I'm not going to go too much into St. Patrick at all because that, that that would deserve a whole different lecture in its own right. And this is just a view of Down Patrick shown Cathedral Hill. You can see Cathedral Hill with the cathedral on the top of it. Uh, just in relation to the town of Down Patrick itself and that that's it in the background of the of the photograph, and I think this is this quite nice because uh, this is a photograph taken in 1929, and so it's taken from an airplane. But it kind of shows the relationship between uh, the monastic site Cathedral Hill and what subsequently became the modern town of Downpatrick. 
and just below the cathedral you can actually see an area uh, of called the tennis courts and that's where we were actually excavating as well. Now the early history of, down, of uh, Cathedral Hill and of Dyke Patrick is quite, is quite um, convoluted, quite uh, complex and I have to admit I haven't really got my, got my head around it fully at the minute and hopefully again as, as the story progresses I'll start getting a better grasp of what's going on during the early medieval period and medieval period in this site. But um, it's, there certainly seems to be a medieval cathedral on the site and we know this from early century uh, pictures of, of the cathedral hills showing, showing the shell of a medieval cathedral. Uh, this is a particularly interesting image because it shows the remains of, of a round tower off to the western end of the cathedral and whenever we see this, whenever we see round towers, we know that uh, there's going to be an early monastic site there. So it was the presence of this round tower that makes us think that uh, Cathedral Hill is actually the site of Dunleft Glass, Dunleft Glassy, that's mentioned uh, quite a lot in the Irish annals. Now, we're not overly sure when a church was first established on Cathedral Hill. Uh, from the annals, we know that there's certainly something here in 496 AD, because the annals of Ulster, uh, I'm not sure if anybody's ever read any of them, but uh, I'll, I'll talk about them just after the talk if you want. They're a, they're a wonderful resource for archaeologists when you're looking into a site, especially sites such as Stone Patrick. But in 496 AD, it's mentioned that Dunleft Glass is stormed. <clears throat> now, there's no, no mention of a church in 496 being on the site, but there has to be something here because you know the lads aren't going to run up an empty hillside and storm nothing, so there has to be something there. In 584 AD, we got uh, a mention of the repose of Fergus, Bishop of Dunleth Glass. So that's our first indication that there is a religious site on top of Cathedral Hill in the late 6th century. Nothing really is mentioned about it then until the middle of the 8th century, until 753 AD. And following this kind of mid 8th century mention, we're starting to get uh, a lot more mentions of, of Dunleth Glass or Dan Patrick. And it's mentioned a lot more regularity and a lot more importance. Um, why there's there's a kind of hiatus in mentions in the annals, I'm not so sure. But I think it's got something to do with the, the expansion of the local king tribe, the kingship of the area called the Delphiatuck. Around about the, the 8th century, they start expanding their influence. They start taking all their lands to the west and other lands to the north, even as far as Bangor. <clears throat> and to me, it seems a wee bit coincidental that you know the, the the local kings are getting a lot bigger and you know bigger and more important, and all of a sudden we're getting a very important monastic site appearing in the annals. Uh, the site seemed to to uh, be very attractive, uh, for want of a better word, to the Vikings, because they attacked it in 825 and 942, and they returned in 989 and completely burnt the place down. Um, the place is obviously then rebuilt because we've got mentions in 1007 AD that the King of Ulster's son was murdered in the church of Dunleth Glass or Down Patrick. In 1010, the abbot was blinded. In 1016, the place was burnt down. In 1040, it was burnt down again. In 1111, it was struck by lightning and burnt down again. So you can see successive sort of burnings and attacks and, and uh, rebuilding episodes. Uh, this date of 1111 is very important as well when we're considering the church in Ireland because 1111, uh, a big meeting happened in Cashel, County Tipperary, called the Synod of Last Brassel. I'm not, I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, but basically what this was, it was, a, it was a restructuring of the church in Ireland. So it kind of took away from monasteries and set up uh, what we call dioceses, and that's where you get the likes of the diocese of Down and Connor, diocese of Clotter appearing. It's a testament to Down Patrick's importance that uh, Down Patrick was actually chosen as the seat of the diocese of Down and Connor. And it was chosen over really important monasteries like Bangor, where we get uh, the likes of Conbanus coming from. <coughs> But also uh, Antrim, and if anybody's from Antrim or knows Antrim town, will know that there's a very 
there's a very uh, well-preserved round tower, a uh, place called the Steeple. And uh, coincidentally, we might be doing some field work there over the next year or so as well. So keep an eye out for that. If you just want to come down and have a wee go. In uh, eleven thirty-eight, then getting back to the history of the site, uh, Saint Malachy established uh, Augustinian Priory on the site. And this was then overtaken in 1177 following the Anglo Norman invasion of Ulster by John de Corsi. And basically, he raided the place and burnt it all down again and built a Benedictine Abbey on the site. And it's this Benedictine Abbey that's given us uh, basically most of the archaeological features that we encountered during 2018 2019. <laughs> during the medieval period, then, the uh, Benedictine Abbey didn't really didn't really fare as as, uh, as well as the monastery beforehand. It was attacked on numerous occasions and again burnt down on numerous occasions, especially during the Bruce Wars in the early 14th century, until finally it, it was dissolved in 1538 under Henry VIII <coughs> with the dissolution of the monasteries. And again, it was uh, completely burnt down by Lord Leonard Grey. And the local inhabitants of Down Patrick took against him, attacking their church, and it earned them the noose. Uh, apparently, he was strung up in the ruins of it. So, it lay as ruins then until the late 18th century, when the decision was made to actually rebuild the cathedral, and that's that's the structure you see on site today. And if you're into your cathedrals, you know it's it's a very nice cathedral. So, if we look at a bird's eye view of Down Patrick. So you think you're a little bird flying over Down Patrick, this is what you'll see. Uh, you can see Cathedral Hill towards the centre of the of the image and the modern town of Down Patrick. But most important is the, the River Coil, and the River Coil is just in the top left hand corner of that image. If you were a little bird flying over here during the medieval period, the landscape would look an awful lot different. Uh, during the 18th century, the coil was actually drained. <coughs> And all the land that you can see between the town and the river now uh, is reclaimed. It used to be quite uh, marshy and it was actually an estuary back then. So due to the science, we can actually re-flood the area without getting our feet wet. And that's sort of what it would have looked like. And Ryan, for your benefit, the green stuff's the land and the blue stuff's the water. Okay. So if we consider Cathedral Hill here, we can see that it's actually it's on a peninsula of land jutting out into the estuary and surrounded on three sides by water. It's almost like a little island in its own right. And you know, this is very common that monastic sites would have been put onto areas like this. If you think about the Devonish island in Fermanagh, very important monastic site as well, is on an island. Um, if we consider other aspects of this landscape as well, just to the north of it, I think it's worth them. Um, worth spending a wee minute or two just talking about this. This is a site called the Mound of Down. <coughs> so anybody who knows Down Patrick, but when you're traveling into the town on the Belfast Road, just before you hit the garage in the roundabout, if you look to the right hand side, you'll see this site. It's a massive sort of embanked enclosure, sort of noble shape. So that's, that's just to the north of Cathedral Hill. And what uh, what the site actually is completely certain about, you know, there's talk about it being a, a Mott and Bailey associated with the Normans, there's talk about it being a prehistoric site, there's talk about it being an early medieval site. Nobody really knows. Back in uh, 2012, we excavated a couple of trenches just in the monument just to see could we get an idea of its date and its function. And we found very, very little, to tell you the truth. And again, I think that this is just kind of give us an indication of what the site actually was. From right underneath the bank, we got a radio carbon date uh, that shows that the bank itself, the large outer bank, was constructed in the 10th, 11th century. So it's later early medieval in dates. And what I think it actually is, is it's a royal site and inauguration site of the Delphi Park as well. So what I think we're looking at is a completely preserved medieval landscape, which is which is quite interesting. You don't often get that. I think it's because this this area was largely underwater and hasn't seen the development that other sites have. Is that you've got that preserved in the landscape? 
Going back to Cathedral Hill, um, Cathedral Hill, because of its uh, associations with St. Patrick, uh, proved very, very um, attractive to antiquarians and as, and as well as uh, more scientific archaeological research in the 20th century. The first real sort of scientific excavation happened in the 1950s by a fellow called Proudfoot. And Proudfoot uh, was digging because of the discovery of two late Bronze Age gold hoards. So these are these are gold amulets and arm rings uh, date to around about 1000 BC or a wee bit later, maybe 800 BC or thereabouts. Now, Proudfoot, I'm not sure if any of you know Down Patrick, but if you go to the Asda car park and look, stand in the Asda car park and look up towards the cathedral, you can see banks and ditches going around and closing the sites. And this, this is what uh, Proudfoot concentrated his efforts on. He, he constantly dug uh, slices going across these ditches. <coughs> Due to the fact he was digging in the 1950s, you're talking about a time before radio carbon dating, and the fact that um, these Bronze Age uh, gold artifacts have been found. He assumed that uh, Cathedral Hill started out life as a Bronze Age hill fort. As which which make it very very important because there there's not that many of them in Ireland. You know you can count them on your fingers and toes how many of them are actually are. Um, the site was uh, reinvestigated in the 1980s by a fellow called Nick Brannan, and he used to work for the for the Department of Environment, the DOE. And Nick uh, investigated other areas of this bank and ditch system and found nothing earlier than the early medieval period. So we've seen that the, the large enclosing banks and ditches going around the site aren't Bronze Age, they're actually early medieval in date. You've got pottery and, and radiocarbon dates of the 8th century from the very bottom of them. Um, unfortunately, an awful lot of the work previously carried out on Downpatrick has not really been published in meaningful degree yet. <coughs> There's been summary reports um, in the Ulster Journal of Archaeology and in the local historical society's journal of Lachiel and the Sinai. But what it's crying out for is crying out for a single narrative of the history and the archaeology of the site. So this is what we're actually going to be working towards now, using the evidence that we got in 2018-19. And kind of piecing it together with the previous evidence of Nick's McDonald's and the Proudfoot's back in the 50s. We try and create that single narrative. <coughs> so when we're talking about our excavations 2018-2019, we start off digging in here in 2018 the in what I call the High Cross Trench. And I gather Lisa White's already talked to you about the results of that trench, so I'm not going to go into it at all. And um, that's where we encountered the, the medieval cemetery. What I'm going to be talking about really is the 2018 2019 community dig and this is where it took place in this kind of little triangular paddock just uh, just to the northwest of the cathedral and that's an overall image of it just showing you a wee bit better so because i don't want to dwell too much in the nitty-gritty of what of what it is what i've what i've got is a collection of the cool things that we found and i'm going to try and piece it together and try and explain what I think it all means at the minute. Okay, so there's going to, there's going to be a lot of photographs of artifacts coming up in the next few slides. Uh, the main trench we opened was just in there, and you may ask why we chose just to dig in and to the left. See, so you can actually see the entrance into the field just there. So it's just up and into the left. Why not dig just a big hole in the middle of the field? And the reason we chose to dig here was well, in '97. Uh, Channel 4's the time team visited the site and you, if any of our views uh, are, are interested in it, if you just type in uh, down, time team down Patrick into YouTube or into Google, you'll get the you'll get the episode of uh, of the time team when they came to down Patrick. So in 1987 they came and they spent three days digging at the Cathedral Hill and it was all this man that you can see in the left hand picture there, that's Nick Brannan. And he invited them uh, basically just to investigate the site and see what was going on. And they dug a number of trenches around Cathedral Hill, but they dug a number of small test pits 
in this triangular paddock called the tennis courts. And they found relatively little, uh, which I think is quite surprising because over the two years we found too much. But on the third day of filming, as it always happens with Time Team, it always happens halfway through on the third day and they make this big show and dance about, you know, do they have time to investigate? They came across a wall and you see the wall in these images here. Um, it looked to be quite a substantial wall, you know, there's a, it was all mortared together. There's quite an awful lot of animal bone and pottery associated with it. But it was the, it was the morphology of the wall that was quite weird. And you could see just in that image, just in front of Nick, you can see sloping masonry actually diving down. And it was these uh, sloping bits of masonry that actually uh, um, uh, kind of prompted Nick to interpret the wall as being uh, from the kitchen plot associated with a Benedictine attic. The trenches in 1997 were backfilled and nothing was said about it since, until we got the opportunity in 2018 to carry out our excavation. And uh, we were wondering just where, where we could go in St. Patrick, because it's all of what we call a scheduled area. So it's, 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 it's been afforded specific uh, protection. So you're very constrained of how much of an area you can open archaeologically to look. So we needed a, a definite target of what we can actually go for. And this wall just proved ideal because we knew it was there. We knew roughly where in the paddock it was. And uh, we knew it was medieval on account of the of the pottery shirts that we were getting into the top of it. What we didn't know was what was what was associated, what was going on around it. So we opened up a trench in 2018 to try and to try and answer those questions. And basically, this this is uh, the end of play in 2018. It was quite a small hole. It was uh, five meters by about six meters wide. <laughs> and you can see we encountered the wall. You can see the sloping masonry on the right hand side of the image. But you can see uh, on the left hand side where the ranging rods banked up against the side of the trench. There's actually two very deep, what we call midden pits. And a midden pit is basically a, a medieval wheelie bin. And these midden pits were stuffed full of animal bone, of pottery, of metal artifacts, of slag. Um, as, as as we got down to the level there, that's the level we stopped at because the hole was too small. And I have to say, I was probably chance my arm taking it to that depth as it is. Uh, but as we got down, that started getting quite wet and quite smelly, you know, so it's very organic, organic rich and all. So it's, it's fantastic, but we couldn't get to the bottom at that time. So we had to come back in 2019 and and try again and just open up a bigger area so we came back in 2019 you can have, this is the trench we opened and um, fair play to the, the historic environment division of the of the, of the uh, department for communities they they have overall um, authority when it comes to opening areas and scheduling monuments like this and i asked for a big hole and they let me have a big hole so you can see that is the 2018 trench, so we re-excavated uh, the backfill of the old trench and we opened up the area by about three quarters, about 75% more. <clears throat> so hopefully I was thinking a wide area like this was going to afford us the opportunity to actually get down to the bottom of these midden pits safely. But also as well, we could we could have a look outside the building and see what was going on in its environs. So over the five weeks, uh, Maya was there and Ryan was there um, and, and a number of other volunteers came down to help us get, give it a go. Uh, over the next five weeks, we dug and we dug and we dug and we ended up with this. So this is the bottom of the midden pits and you can see more of the wall stretched out. You see one, two, three midden pits at least. Now this, they probably carry on further on beyond the trench. <clears throat> we didn't excavate up at the very top of the trench, just up there because there was, there was uh, a quite live electricity wire that uh, seems to be going across the top of that, so we just boxed that off and left it. But you can see that the, these mitten pits are huge, and it, was, it must have been a big undertaking to actually construct them in the medieval period. Uh, they're about two and a half meters deep, uh, straight sides, and, you, and, a, and a flat bottom. And you see the one just at the bottom of the image there is, is actually full of water. And that's because it's been excavated through the water table. That's the natural groundwater that's seeping up 
So these things would have always been wet. And you can imagine, like, if you're throwing food scraps and all down into a wet environment, the smell, you know, they, so they're starting to build build an image up about what, what this place might have looked like and smelled like and sounded like during the medieval period. But the good thing about that water is that that meant that the lower deposits of these mitten pits were always wet. And that means that organics uh, get preserved very well. Organics, like we were hoping we would get leather, we didn't actually find any leather. But what we did find was quite an awful lot of wood. That's my wife, that's Mary, she is a wood specialist. Uh, dendro, the dendro archaeologist, and uh, the, this is her in a very much less pregnant state. And she, we were fortunate enough that uh, Mary was actually on hand to instruct us in the appropriate way to to excavate, lift, and um, preserve wooden artifacts. And you see her working on a fragment of a wooden plank. Right. This is a medieval wooden plank. This thing, these things don't ordinarily survive in an archaeological site. Usually, they just rot. But they're here. <coughs> By Patrick, which is fantastic. We got a number of uh, wooden artifacts from this basin deposit. The one on the left hand side there looks like it's the, the bottom of a handle of a hammer or something like that. The one on the right is quite quite funny. It's it's that that's a wooden dial that seems to fit into that hole in that small bit of wood. And they were found together, so that it's it's very tempting to say that they went into the ground together and you know you're kind of thinking what could that actually be could it be a structural fitting of a building or could it be like a fragment of a, of a chair or a table or something you know it got broken and someone was up over it and they just chucked it in the bin but it's really these two planks that tell the story or tell a very interesting story and, and we're very fortunate in queens that we have the likes of of dave brown in uh, up in uh, up in dendro that can uh, can look at wood like this and actually actually tease out that story. Uh, these are two planks. They're oak. Uh, they were found at the very base of that midden pit. And uh, Dave was able to take a little slice off these wooden planks, and not only give us a date and a very very fine nice date, but he was also able to tell by the sequence of the tree rings that um, it's likely that these planks of wood are actually from Dublin not from Downpatrick. So the tree that produced in Dublin, it was chopped down, it was probably made into an artifact like a barrel when it was then transported up to Downpatrick. And uh, that, that's that's quite a nice story because it's shown that Downpatrick isn't just sitting there in isolation in the medieval period. It has links with other medieval centres in Ireland. And I mentioned the date before, the date came back, it was uh, 1197 plus or minus nine years. You know, you can't get better dating for the base of your middle pit than that. <coughs> we found uh, a number of interesting artifacts that, that are quite weird. Like this, this is, I didn't understand what this was immediately when, when it was shown to me when the volunteers found it. It's made of bone. And you can see it's got like a paddle end at one end, it's got a hole drilled in the other end. And I was just thinking like, what, what on earth is it? And I was, I was quite fortunate, one of the younger volunteers on site a girl called Abby is uh, quite a proficient artist. And she says to me, I know exactly what that is. And she goes, it's the, it's the tuning thing from a harp. Uh, so the string would have went up through the wee hole and then they would have used the wee saddle end just to, just to turn it to get the right pitch on the string. And the next day she actually turned up with her harp. And this thing cost like two and a half, three thousand pounds. And she turns up to a muddy archeological site with this pristine musical instrument. And uh, well, I, I could just see a lot of disasters happen, but thankfully nothing happened to everybody from Tickety Boo. But it was interesting to see that, you know, the old versus the new, this this is where that artifact would have went on the harp. You know, there's the modern variation of it, albeit made of metal. Not only that, it's given us an indication of, of stuff that's going on that's not, like we know this, this is an area of prayer. We know it's a monastic site. But, you know, there's music going on as well, you know, so it's, again, this kind of teasing your story. And Abby actually brought her harp out onto site and started playing away for us. And, you know, I have to tell you, it's one of the most serene sort of days of excavating that I've ever, that I've ever done. But not only that, it's that it's this link with the past 
that she's doing. Like she's probably the first person to play a harp here in five, six hundred years. <coughs> this is a, another little artifact that was uh, that was shown to me. Um, and this was actually our youngest person ever on site. A wee seven-year-old called Annie found this, and uh, she came up to me and said, "Mr. Mr." You know, we just put them in a, in a corner of the trench and just let them die. Because, like, we youngsters just want to find weird shaped stones and worms and chase birds around with worms and all that. So, I didn't actually expect them to, to find anything too interesting. But she came up at night. It's the first time I've been able to sworn at a seven year old when I saw it. It's a wonderful example of a ninth century, uh, what we call a dress pin. So, it's made of bronze and you see it's very highly decorated. And you see the close up there in the right hand image, it probably would have had enamel or something set into it as well. But it's just a fun I love artifacts like this because it's the personal touch. Somebody actually owned this and someone lost it. You know, you can imagine somebody losing the wedding ring or something like that. <coughs> this is uh, one of the stalwarts of our, our volunteers. This is a fellow called John. And um, John was uh, digging away one day and he came up to me. And he showed me this stone. He showed me actually, he didn't show me this piece, but he showed me the reverse of it. And he was asking me, uh, is it down? Because I was telling the volunteers you have to look at each stone and like, you know, each little crack or each little line might mean something. And I says to John, look, I, I don't know if it is something or not. Uh, Rory, my colleague Rory O'Boyle, some of you might know, took it off to the tap to wash it and he let out a big yelp out of him. And I was like, oh, geez, he's dropped on his foot or something like that. And he's broken it and he came back and he says uh, that face has nothing on it but when you turn it around it's got a wonderful cross carved into it and what this is is it's uh, it's it's earlier than benedictine abbey it actually dates to the early 9th century around about 820 830 a.d but it's, it's what we call a cross slab you know we're very slab of rock and there's a cross on it but what this would have been would have been it's a grave marker it's a marker for, for a monk who would have died in the early 9th century and been buried in St. Patrick, which I think is really, really cool. Um, John found it in a, in a later medieval deposit, you know, so then you got to kind of think, how did it end up there? Was it just chucked in? Did anybody know about it? Did it just, were they like myself at the very start and didn't see the cross on it and just thought it was just a random bit of stone and chucked it in the bin for a while? <laughs> this is one of our finer metal artifacts. Um, it's it's a, it's the end of a buckle or a strap end, what we call a strap end. And when we're talking about the religious context of this site, you know, we're thinking it could be it could be a, a, an end of a strip of leather or something that would have went around a, a Bible or something like that. Um, we know it's decorated. We can see it's obviously see it's decorated, but it's very highly corroded. So we're lucky in Queens as well. We've got all all different machines at our disposal. X-ray it, and when you X-ray it, you can actually see through the corrosion and see. You might have to tilt your head over to the side of you, but to see that better. But what it looks like is 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 a bird. It looks to be pecking at itself, and it looks to be sitting on a branch of a tree. And there's a biblical story about the pelican that's that's pecking its breast to make itself bleed. So it can feel it's young, and you know, again, it's, you know, are we looking at a religious artifact? Is this is this like a biblical scene or something on this little strap end? Is this talent stuff would have been around the Bible? We're not sure. The metalwork specialist has had a look at this and says dates to around about 1380 to 1420, 40 or thereabouts. Uh, the pottery that uh, Aidan is hopefully going to be looking at uh, is a. Uh, um, comprises quite a big chunk of the artifact sandwich that we found. And as I said, Dadog is currently piecing bits and pieces of it back together. Um, an awful lot of it is sort of your generic medieval 13th, 14th century pottery like this. And one of the things I want to be able to find out from you once it's finished the study is how much of the pottery that we find actually locally produced or how much of it is actually imported in. And that'll give us an idea of the, of the wealth of the monastery. <coughs> um, I love that uh, that green glazed jug you can see on the right because it's decorated with what looks like grapes. You see the kind of clay uh, uh, relief or impression of the grapes inside the pot. 
Um, you know, is that giving an indication of the contents of the pot? We don't know. You know, could you say it's wine? But I will say it's it's probably not going to be white enough anyway. And um, not only that, um, not only the pottery came out, but some other ceramics were actually found. And this was found in the soil sample, so we didn't actually see this on site. We only discovered this just before Christmas, when I was in the office, and I was I was um, I was actually getting uh, some soil samples ready for real garden dating. So I had to process them through, and this thing was caked in mud, and it was obviously shoved in the bag. Somebody thought it was a stone. But when we wash the mud off it, it's quite clear that it's actually uh, the head of, of a wee animal, be it a, a little cow or a horse or a deer or something like that. But um, it, it's absolutely gorgeous, especially when you see, when you look at the right hand image, you look at the of the face of the close up, you can actually see the person's fingerprints. Now, um, a student just gone by, a girl called Melissa, carried out her thesis, her dissertation on fingerprints fingerprints in, in pottery and clay. So hopefully she's going to have a wee look at this and, and work out who actually made this, you know, was it a child, was it a woman, was it a man, and what, what is the purpose of this, you know, is it a child's toy? Or, um, you know, could, could, it be, could it be something like part of the activity scene or something like that? I'm not so sure. So that was a pretty cool video. Um, this is the material that provided the bulk of, uh, of the of the material culture that we found in the middle that is animal bone. And this is what poor Ryan's going to be spending the next year of his life going through. <coughs> um, Finbar at the time um, had a cursory look at the animal bone and it seems to be majority uh, uh, sheep and goat and pig in it. Um, Obviously, as Ryan goes through his study, he's going to be able to tell us an awful lot more about it. What I can definitely say is, like, the monks certainly were not going hungry, and they certainly weren't vegetarian. But as an important aspect of the site, it's finding out everyday life for what these people were actually like, what they were eating. And we know they're eating an awful lot of animals, but we know there's other things in the diet, and we get that from uh, the soil samples. So as we go through site, and you'll learn this in your in your in your training excavation, we take soil samples so we can actually look at the soil the years after the trenches are all back filled. And we, we do a thing called a uh, flotation where we actually take all the organics out of the soil. You can see this is just a wee mock up of what, what we actually do. But in the little sieve, you can see all the charcoal, and within that will be all the charred seeds and grains of what they're eating. And this is just a close up of what. what is in that fluid material. And in Brian Patrick, they're eating an awful lot of barley, an awful lot of oats as well. As well to this, they're, they're eating an awful lot of wheat, which is curious because during the medieval period, your wheat is your cash crop. And again, that's given us an indication of how rich Brian Patrick was as a monastery in the medieval period. We got uh, aspects of the building itself. And um, as, as we know from the, the from the historical, what we were talking about earlier, the annals. It was uh, burnt down and knocked down numerous occasions. So like there's a constant evolving monastery here, it's constantly being rebuilt and building material was chucked into the midden pits, including this very fine carved stone. This is actually the, the middle stone of a, of a window embrace or something like that, with a lovely mason's mark on the top of it. That we were getting lots of roof slates, we were getting lots of window glass as well. So we're slowly building up a picture of what this place would have been like. You know, we're getting a place of the diet. We're getting, we're getting a look at what the building actually looked like. And you know, we can actually get the idea that Down Patrick is not just a monastery, but it's actually a thriving community. It's, it's like a little village. It's basically Down Patrick before Down Patrick was built. And um, one of the other trenches we excavated was over here. And the reason why we chose to dig there was because uh, there was a very distinct hollow in the ground. So like as archaeologists, we're kind of looking at indications uh, of where we should dig. Uh, this place is completely flat because it was turned into a tennis court, but over in this corner, there's a very distinct hollow, and there has to be a reason why that hollow is actually there. And that's the reason why it's there. It's actually a filled in well. Uh, unfortunately, this, this feature wasn't fully excavated. Uh, you could see 
trench is too small and it's going too deep. And you can actually see we're fighting against the, the rising water of the well in there as well. But again, it was stuffed full to the brim of, of pottery sherds and animal bones as well. So, you know, it was it was filled in and we have an idea that it was actually filled in quite quickly during a medieval period on the of pottery. Uh, one of the artifacts we actually found from this feature is quite interesting. Is this uh, lovely strip of metal? It's bronze, alloy bronze, um, but you can actually see there's uh, ten small circular mounts and four quite oval larger mounts. And uh, what uh, if we X-ray it as well? You can see there's little small mounting holes at the top and the bottom. What this item is, it's a fragment of what we call a reliquary. Now, a reliquary would have been a box containing the bones of the saint, or it would have been attached to like a wooden cross or attached to an altar or something like that. And again, the metalwork specialist looked at it and says it's, it's probably later medieval, probably 14th, 15th century in date. <coughs> but the thing you got to think about is like, how did it end up down a well? And uh, originally, originally each of these little mounts would have had like a glass bead or a little bit of polished glass or something like that or a semi-precious stone, but that's not there anymore. You know, is this, in fact, you know, the precious stuff's been wiped out of it and the scrappy bit of metal's been yinged down a well. You know, what happened? Um, you know, does this relate to a remodeling of the cathedral or does it relate to a period of strife where somebody's come in, wiped up the nice shiny things and chucked the crappy bit of metal away? Um, I really want to talk to is this little trench up here. The reason we excavated on uh, the, there's like a there's like a little copse of trees in the middle there. And the reason we excavated around the other side was I wanted to see was there any sign of of what we call the cloister of the abbey heading up in this direction. So we opened up it was only a uh, what we call an evaluative trench. It was only having a little coaxy just to see what's going on. Find. These are later medieval features. We didn't find any of the buildings, but it's again, it's given us a, a new aspect to what's actually going on in the site. Found a, a very rough pathway, a cobbled path, and uh, these are interesting because they're not in isolation. They're either going to somewhere or coming from somewhere. But it's quite a substantial stone line pit up in the top corner. Now again, the fill of this pit. It's a basal late medieval period. It was filled again with loads of animal bone, loads of pottery shirts, but as well loads of uh, uh, metalwork and residues like copper and iron as well. So we're getting an indication that we are quite close to to workshops or to production areas or something like that. Probably, you know, given that we're on top of the of the monastic hill, it's quite specialist metalwork and maybe copper, bronze, or silver or something like that. Out of this, out of that pit, we also find this. There's a lovely little artifact, and it's a, obviously it's a it's a little bone dice. Um, but you know, that's each of them little edges is a centimeter long. You know, ten millimeters. It's tiny. It's positively medieval in date, uh, but it looks as if it might have dropped out of a modern, you know, monopoly set. But do you think it's so small? But each little number, each little dot and circle has been so carefully etched into it. It's fantastic. But again, it's shown us a different aspect to life in the in the monastery as well. You know, these people aren't just eating and praying. You know, they're drinking and they're gambling or playing games as well. Now, one of our other volunteers, a little boy called Frankie, found uh, this um, lovely kind of 12th, 13th century arrowhead as well. And again, this is this is bringing us right back into periods of strife in the monastery. You know, was this fired into it or was it fired out of it? I'm not too sure. We find this lovely. This is what we call a, a trial piece, and this is giving us an indication that there might have been a school up on Cathedral Hill during the medieval period. Now, a trial piece is basically, you know, kind of in primary school, you start off writing in pencil, and then when your handwriting gets neat enough, the teacher gives you a pen. It's the same sort of principle back in the medieval period, and um, before the monks were allowed to to draw on vellum and, and create manuscripts and like that, they had to practice their letters and pictures on slate. 
And sometimes these can be very difficult to read. So what I've, what I've done, we've got a what we call a blue intensity scanner in the workroom and work. And what I did was I scanned the object in and blew it up. And I was able to kind of trace over it, over the letters, just to see if I could try and make out uh, anything that was saying. And I guess it doesn't really help us at all, but anyway. It looks as if we've got like a capital See if I can hit that one. Yeah, got like a little capital H or capital F or capital A or something. Uh, that looks like an Irish T, maybe it's an Irish B. That's a G and an O, you know, when we're talking about a monastic site, you know, are they, are they trying to spell God? Or are they just practicing their actual letters? And we're not too sure. It'd be actually interesting if anybody is once he's doing any further work in these trial pieces to try and work out, try and decipher what it is, I'm not sure. <coughs> that was <clears throat> that was the later medieval stuff that we actually found, but it was on what was underneath all the stuff that's the real interesting thing, and it's, and it's kind of turned uh, the whole story of Cathedral Hill on its head. It's the remains of a ditch, and it's quite difficult to see in this picture, so what we'll do is we'll actually look at the side of the trench and Kind of picture the side of the trench kind of like a big cake or something you're you're able to look and see the different layers going up this is the end of the trench so what we have is our big our later medieval pit that was there but it's actually cut through the earlier feature that you can see that you know by the black dashed line there uh so what i think we've got is quite a large flat bottom ditch and from the very base and deposit of this ditch we found one shirt of pottery and we were able to get a rated carbon date of 1282 to 1059 BC. So this feature is late Bronze Age in date. And again, we're kind of thinking, you know, we're thinking back to what Proudfoot was saying, we're thinking back to the, the gold artifacts that were found in the 1950s. You know, was Proudfoot right? I don't know if he was right or not. I don't know if we can actually say that this is, uh, this is evidence of a late Bronze Age hill fort. We, we only clipped the, the feature in the very corner of the trench, so we would need to go back and open up a wider area um, just to see where this feature is actually running. But, you know, all that we can really say for certain is Bronze Age and date, but it has to be something. Like, are, we looking at a, are we looking at the Hillfort thing back? I'm not sure that this is, a, this is the, uh, the ditch of the Hillfort uh, Hockey Sport in County Armagh excavated by Professor Jim Mallory of Queen's uh, back in and uh, th this actually uh, was the student training dig for a number of years and they came back and back and back in series of seasons but you can see yourself the ditch is absolutely huge I'm not sure if that's what we've got to be uh, the ditch going around a Bronze Age burial or a barrow I'm not certain either mundane something going around a Bronze Age roundhouse Again, without going back and open up a bigger area, we can't possibly, possibly, we can only guess at this stage is what I'm trying to get at. So we start grouping these artifacts together and what it actually means for the site. You know, we're, get, we're getting our religious, um, our rel indications of the religious nature of the site there. We've got a reliquary fragment, we've got our, our bookstrap end that might went around the Bible, and we've got our lovely cross slab. Uh, we're starting to get a picture of what this place would have looked like you know we're starting to build up an image of this building itself we're getting an idea of the diet of the monks we're also getting an idea of what the people are actually are doing they're they're playing games they're gambling they're listening to music but as lisa as lisa probably already talked about as well we actually afford to have a look at the community of down patrick and and this is getting back to this idea of community excavations you know we were able to get the local community investigating the ancient community in Down Patrick, which is fantastic. And, and shout out to this young man, this is Oren. He's he was he was our young one of our younger uh, volunteers on the site and he was there all day every day and he's gonna make a fantastic archaeologist in the end as well. Um, it was a community excavation and this is where I'm getting all soppy about it here, but it, what we've done is we've actually created a little community and we've all kind of stuck together and we've stuck in contact with each other and, and it's fantastic because like these folks know the likes of metal detectors in the area of Dan Patrick and they know 
you know, the no farmers and all, and if a farmer finds something in his field or a metal detector finds something, like, you know, it, it's, it's usually sent to myself or Rory or Cormac, you know, over WhatsApp or something like that, you know. So it's fantastic. It's just it's just keeping that link in with the community. Um, so over the two years we've had in the region of 167 volunteers working with us and uh, it wasn't just the volunteers that made this site a success but it was the people who actually came to see the site. Uh, we're on St. Patrick's Trail is where we're digging you know, people, especially Americans. Americans are a weird, weird bunch and Australians were coming to the site of St. Patrick's Burial and there was us just sitting there as well. So we took the opportunity to invite them in and to show them and talk to them about what we were finding and what we think about the means. And over the two years, we got 5,500 people from all over the world coming to see the excavations and learning about it, you know, which is fantastic. And that, that's one of the things that I have to impress upon you. If you uh, continue on to be archaeologists after your degree, it's like it's all about getting the information out there. There's no point in us doing this work if we're going to sit in the information and not tell anybody about it. And thinking back to Abbey and talking about the Americans, and um, that this is this is a group of American tourists, and they just would not leave. No matter you know we would have like we have to get back to work, have to get back to work. They just wouldn't go. And it was funny to actually see the tour guide trying to trying to shepherd them back onto the tour bus because you know they, they had to get back to Belfast to get on the cruise ship and go home. And um, but she was like us, like herding cats trying to get them away. But again, we would like to think that that is a that's an added an added sort of bonus that they're getting when they come to see an archaeological excavation like them. Um, I'm sure all of you are friends with the uh, Archaeology of Queen's Facebook page. But again it shows uh, I just, just picked this random um this random post I put up one evening about about the little bone dice that was found. A reach there of nineteen thousand nine hundred and ninety six people. So like on the 10th of August 2019, nearly 20,000 people knew that we were digging in Down Patrick at that time. And it was a brilliant way to get the information out to people and get people knowing about what you're actually doing. There's a list of acknowledgements. Everybody, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, you know, there's a number of people you have to thank. I'll not read them out, but I don't want to bore you. Basically, all the people who are involved in, in the excavation. Uh, the staff and all the students at Queen's, you know, especially during this, this COVID time, these are ensuring that that the work is enabled to go on. Um, there, there's still an awful lot of post ex work to do. If anybody's interested, then just give me a shout at all. We'll get just washing samples and washing bowls and this, that and the other. There's an awful lot still to do. And uh, obviously, obviously that that's our details. If anybody wants to give me a shout, there's my email address as well. Okay, I think we'll leave it at that. See you at the clock now. Thank you. Have you had enough of me? Brian, thank you very much. I'll stop the recording here.